Our reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up the mountain to the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and will arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. I learned something about Advent a couple of weeks ago. For as long as I have been here in Chico, California, we have designated each Sunday of Advent as hope, peace, uh, joy, and love. Four Sundays in Advent, four designations, four candles on our Advent wreath with a Christ candle in the middle that we save for December 25th. I used to think this tradition was as old as the church itself. Uh, every mainline church I've ever been involved with practice this tradition. And so, you know, four Sundays in Advent, uh, you've got four candles, purple, 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 pink, and the white Christ candle in the middle, okay? So I figured, you know, th this has been going on a while. But then all of a sudden, I started noticing discrepancies in the designation of the candles, and uh, what the candles were called. Th things didn't make too much sense. Uh, every year, Brianne and Jay Nelson and I would sit down and have a discussion about what Sunday in Advent was and, and what order, order do we light the candles and things like that. And so, uh, you know, it, it's hope, peace, joy, and love, right? Yeah, sure. Except when you do a Google search. And when you do a Google search, you discover that for some, it's hope, love, joy, and peace. Okay, all right. Uh, and then I found a source that had hope, faith, joy, and peace. Yeah. Where's the love? Literally, where's, where's the love? To complicate matters even more, I found another source where the candles represent prophecy, Bethlehem, shepherd, and angels. There was no consistency, none whatsoever. And so I thought, well, let's check out the history of the church's relationship with Advent candles. Let's go back, because surely this must be some ancient Christian tradition, maybe, maybe mid-2nd century A.D. or something like that, you know? No. In fact, for the longest time, the church didn't even care when Jesus was born. And it wasn't until 221 A.D. that a church historian named Sextus Julius Africanus identified December 25th as a possible date of Jesus' birth. Now, I am not going to go into all the problems that go into that date and how illogical that is. Um, it wasn't until much later that the church actually celebrated Christmas. And even then, it was a minor feast in the church year compared to some of the other feasts that they had. And so as the Christian faith started moving farther and farther north, uh, many believe that the church started nonchalantly appropriating pagan solstice festivals. And, uh, you know, winter solstice represented the rebirth of the sun. 
because it's the shortest day of the year and from that point on days just keep getting longer and longer until the summer solstice when they start getting shorter and shorter again so why not connect the birth of god's son to this pagan belief maybe we might win a few pagans over too who knows right still this doesn't answer the question about the proper order of the Advent candles. Get this. Advent candles didn't make an appearance in the Christian faith and practice until 1839 in Hamburg, Germany. Pastor Johann Henrik Wickern used a cartwheel uh, to help the kids in his mission school keep track of the days until Christmas. And so uh, there would be these little candles that would be lit every day. And then on Sundays, you had a big white candle. And that helped them you know, build up some anticipation for when, Christian, uh, when Christmas came. And you might be thinking, wow, that, what a great idea, Pastor Winrick. Where'd you come up with that one? Well, he borrowed the idea from ancient pagans in Scandinavia. They would place lit candles on a wheel as an offering to their god of light in the hopes that the earth's wheel would be turned back towards the sun, thereby bringing light and warmth. I hope you all understand that, that Christmas would be rather dull were it not for the pagans. Okay, we're still back to the original question. Where did the colored candles come from? Where'd they come from? Because, see, I'm still trying to figure out whether I'm being liturgically correct here, right? Uh, what candle am I supposed to light? What order am I to light these candles in? What do they even mean? It's confusing. Well, come to find out, German immigrants brought this tradition to America in the 20th century and we're the ones who started uh, assigning them colors and and things like that we're the ones that finally started using them in worship services and there is no rhyme or reason as to what color or even what the correct way to use them so you know who gets to determine the order of the advent candles this year <laughs> i do And I know the caller says it's Hope Sunday, but I'm going to play the pastor card here and declare that it is Peace Sunday. Why? Because Bill just read this, this wonderful passage in Isaiah 2 that talks about uh, the ones who would beat their swords into plowshares and their, and their uh, spears into pruning hooks. This is the quintessential peace passage so how did i determine what passage of scripture i read this morning because i follow the revised common lectionary which has only been around since 1992 <laughs> i i own my hypocrisy it's good anyway isaiah was a prophet who lived in jerusalem before the Babylonian Empire uh, conquered Judah and Israel and then shipped all the leaders back to Babylon for 70 years. And politically speaking, this was a mess. There was a threat from the, the Assyrians in the north and you had the Egyptians in the west and of course the Babylonians over to the east. Uh, and this once formidable kingdom of Israel was now a divided and corrupt nation with corrupt kings. We talked about this. We had Bible study about this a couple of years ago. I think it was during COVID. I don't know anymore. But we've talked about this. We understand uh, what was happening here as this nation was collapsing. Uh, this weakened their ability to defend their enemies. Uh, and so Jerusalem became a target for occupation by these three superpowers who wanted their resources and uh, wanted their land. So according to Isaiah, 
what was to blame for uh, Israel's situation, for Jerusalem's situation? Sin. Remember, there's a difference between sin and sin. This was sin that we're talking about here. Uh, they, according to Isaiah, uh, were dishonest, corrupt, and immoral. They craved wealth and luxury. They were irresponsible, and they got into the habit of oppressing people who were on the lower rungs of the social uh, ladder. They worshipped other gods. They rebelled against God's divine will. They were facing some big trouble. And many other prophets did everything that they could to warn Israel and Judah about what would happen if they didn't repent. So in chapter 1, a chapter before Bill read here, in chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, Isaiah said, How the faithful city has become a whore. She that was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your wine is mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions to thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not defend the orphan, and the widow's cause does not come before them. In the big picture, though, Isaiah, his message to Jerusalem became a message of promise in the midst of despair and hope uh, for eventual redemption. Now, the passage that Bill read starts out with the words, in the days to come. Now, most people think, uh-oh, when uh, a, a prophet who's speaking about a corrupt and sinful nation says, in the days to come, because this is where we usually hear about wars and plagues and famines and comets and all of those scary things. But instead, Isaiah paints a different picture. He talks about the establishment of God's house on the highest mountains. One where all nations will travel in order to receive fair arbitration and learn to walk in God's path. The results of this arbitration? People will lay down their swords and spears and transform their weapons of war into plowshares and pruning hooks. Instruments of provision and uh, for basic human needs, because that's what you do with plowshares and pruning hooks. They will study war no more. They will walk together in God's light. All nations will walk in God's light. Again, this does not seem like the typical repent or be destroyed message that you'd expect from a prophet who's warning people about their imminent demise. Isaiah's prophecy doesn't even refer to the end of time or beyond like others do. He anticipates this radical transformation of this time and this reality. And, and this vision is for all peoples and all generations, not just Israel. God shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. Sounds kind of like something Jesus would say, right? Well, that's interesting because Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah more than any other book in the Old Testament. So it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus' vision is in line with Isaiah's vision. The connection between this promise in the book of Isaiah and the kingdom of God that Jesus preached is, is obvious. It's easy to see. Now, the prophet Isaiah dreamed of a day when the wolf and the lamb would lie down together. You're like, isn't that the lion and the lamb, Jesse? You'd think so, right? Anybody ever hear of the Mandela effect? The Mandela effect is, is, uh, is when we think that we know something so well, but really it, it's not. And the reason why they call it the Mandela effect, because people will say, uh, for a long time would say Nelson Mandela had died in prison, uh, but he didn't. And people are like, no, I swear. Another, another one is the Monopoly board, uh, the game of Monopoly. Does the little guy have a monocle? Yes or no? Yes for monocle? No for monocle. There we go. She, you can tell who is the Monopoly player in here. 
But so many people will just swear that no, he wore a monopoly. That, that is, that's what the Mandela effect is. And so when I say the, the wolf will lay down with the lamb, that's what the prophecy actually says. There's nothing in there about the lion and the lamb. Just that's your piece of trivia for today. But anyway, what this is saying that the laws of nature that cause the strong to devour the weak are going to be abolished. And you think, well, how in the world does that happen? That doesn't even make any sense because that's the way wolves are wired. Wolves naturally prey on lambs. They devour lambs. They can't help it. Yes, but a human who takes bribes, runs after gifts, and does not defend the orphan and the widow can help it. They can restrain their sinful nature. Now, it takes some practice. It takes some imagination, but it can be done. And imagination is what this text is all about here. Transferring our hope to another reality. One that is different than the one that we live in. One where we can take for granted as immutable social realities can be reformed and transformed into new ones. Where we have the courage to redeem injustices no matter what the odds are. So, maybe this is Hope Sunday. I don't know. Theologian Walter Brueggemann makes the connection between Isaiah's message and Jesus' vision of God's kingdom. Uh, He made this in the commentary called Text for Preaching. He writes, the vision of Isaiah is an act of imagination that looks beyond present dismay through the eyes of God to see what will be that is not yet. That is the function of promise and therefore Advent in the life of faith. Under promise, in Advent, faith sees what will be that is not yet. When all the nations learn God's ways, there is no longer a need for war. War is no longer the arbitrator. Instead, God is the judge. God is the arbiter of justice. And what does God's justice look like? Love and peace, not nationalism and endless war. Well, here we are talking about peace again. Maybe it's Peace Sunday. Or is it Hope Sunday? I guess you can't have one without the other, can you? I guess let's just say it's both. Is that okay with you? So maybe you are the deciders. Can we say it's both this week? Okay, some of you are saying, yeah, but what's next week? We'll worry about that later. (laughs) It's good. Isaiah invites us to live and walk into this vision. Don't just sit around and wait for it. It is so close to being here. Jesus would often tell his disciples and those he taught that the kingdom of God is at hand. Isaiah was saying the same thing. He wasn't just making a proclamation. He was setting a vision. The message of Advent is how will you accept this invitation and how will you extend it to others? See, many times we talk about the journey of faith without adequately describing, as Isaiah does, what that destination looks like. What is the kingdom of God? What does the kingdom of God look like for our community here in Chico, California? How does that vision guide our ministry as uh, as individuals, as a church? If God's vision is indeed universal, and it embraces the idea that war does not lead to peace, is that really good news? And for whom? Right? If division 
does not lead to peace. What does that say to us here in the first quarter of the 21st century when it seems like everything is all about division? War does not lead to peace. Division does not lead to peace. Only relying on God's love, forgiveness, and grace leads to peace. And that peace is driven by the hope that we have as we anticipate and prepare ourselves for the birth of Christ.